In this video, we'll introduce some of the practical aspects of capacitors and inductors. As usual in the lab videos, I'll assume that you're getting the theoretical information about these devices from the textbook and the lecture videos. We'll spend our time in this video then looking at some physical capacitors and inductors, talking a bit about how these devices store energy, show you how to identify capacitance and inductance values on physical parts, and show you how to measure capacitances using your DMM. Sadly, most affordable DMMs do not have an inductance measurement capability. So for this course, we'll just have to believe the nominal inductance values for any inductors that we use. First, we'll talk about capacitors. Typical capacitor construction consists of two conductive elements separated by a non-conductive material called a dielectric. The dielectric prevents current flow from one element to the other and is characterized by its permittivity, designated by the Greek letter epsilon. If we apply a voltage difference between the two plates, charges will accumulate on the upper and lower plates. These will create an electric field between the plates. The capacitor stores energy in this electric field. Capacitance is a quantity which tells us how much energy a capacitor can store. For a capacitor consisting of two parallel plates, like the one we saw in the previous slide, the capacitance is A times epsilon over D. Where A is the cross-sectional area of the plates, D is the spacing between the plates, and epsilon is the permittivity of the dielectric. So we can increase capacitance by increasing the cross-sectional area, decreasing the spacing, or increasing the permittivity. Now let's take a look at a few physical capacitors measure their capacitance to get a feeling for these relationships. This is a variable parallel plate capacitor. The two plates actually consist of multiple plates each. So these fins all create one plate. They're all electrically connected. And the other plate is created by these fins. The two sets of fins are separated by air gaps between them, so the dielectric is simply air. If I turn the knob on the side of the capacitor, I can increase or decrease the capacitance by increasing or decreasing the area of overlap of the conductors. Let's measure the capacitance and verify that that's what actually happens. To measure capacitance using my DMM, I plug the leads into the COM and volt ohm ports. I also connect the leads to the two terminals of the capacitor. To measure capacitance, I turn my knob so that the indicator lines up with the little capacitor symbol. Currently, there's little or no overlapping area between these fins, and I get about 0.1 nanofarads. By turning the knob, I can increase the overlapping area and increase the capacitance. Now it's at about 0.4 nanofarads. If the fins are entirely overlapped, I get about 0.7 nanofarads. Now let's take a look at a very simple homemade capacitor. My capacitor consists of two wires, which are approximately parallel they make two conductive elements with a dielectric between them, which is currently air. I can use this property to measure water level. If I change the permittivity between these, it'll change the capacitance. If I insert my wires into this tube of water, then when I change the water level, I will also change the capacitance between these wires. Let's connect our DMM, change the water level, and see how it works. Now, when the water level is low, our capacitance is about a half a nanofarad. Adding some water to this increases the water level and should cause the capacitance to go up. Now let's look at some typical capacitors which we'll use to create electric circuits. The capacitors I'll show you are from the Digital Analog Parts Kit. The general principles are applicable to most capacitors. Capacitors are generally described by the type of dielectric material and their overall construction. Most of the capacitors in our parts kit are disc shaped, like this one. On these types of capacitors, the nominal capacitance is encoded as three numbers printed on the capacitor. These numbers provide a capacitance in picofarads in exponential notation. The first two numbers are the mantissa of the number, and the third number is the exponent. For example, this capacitance has the digits 103 printed on it. This means that its capacitance is 10 times 10 to the third picofarads. A picofarad is 1 times 10 to the minus 12 farads. Therefore, the capacitance of this capacitor is 10 times 10 to the third picofarads, which is times 10 to the minus 12, which is equal to 
10 times 10 to the minus 9, or 10 nanofarads. And our actual measured capacitance is about 11 and a half nanofarads. Electrolytic capacitors are also fairly common. In electrolytic capacitors, one or both of the conductive plates are not metallic. These capacitors tend to have a relatively high capacitance for their size. The electrolytic capacitors in your parts kits are can-shaped rather than disc-shaped. Electrolytic capacitors are polarized. That means they don't really work the same way if you switch the polarity of the voltage at their terminals. The polarity is indicated by the length of the leads on the capacitor. The anode has a longer wire than the cathode. It is intended that the anode always be at a higher voltage than the cathode. If you reverse the polarity, the capacitor properties will be different. In fact, if you apply a voltage in which the cathode is at a higher voltage than the anode, the capacitor can explode. If you do this, by the way, I recommend that you wear eye protection. I've personally never blown up a capacitor by reversing its polarity, but there's a first time for everything. The electrolytic capacitors in our kit are physically large enough so that the capacitance is printed directly on the side of the capacitor. This capacitor, for example, is nominally 220 microfarads. The printing on the side of the capacitor also provides additional information. The cathode is indicated by a white stripe with a minus sign on it, and the maximum allowable safe voltage is also printed on the side. This capacitor's rated voltage is 10 volts. Now let's talk a bit about inductors. Inductors, like capacitors, store electrical energy. Unlike capacitors, inductors store energy in a magnetic field. Typical inductors are constructed by winding a conductive wire around a central core. When current runs through the coil, a magnetic field is created. The inductance of an inductor is indicative of the amount of energy that can be stored by the inductor. The inductance is typically related to the number of turns the coil takes around the central core and the core material. Ferrite core materials typically result in relatively high inductance. Here's a very simple homemade inductor. I've simply wrapped wire around a carriage bolt. If I connect a voltage source to the wire, current will flow through the wire and a magnetic field will be created. To create a fairly large magnetic field, I'll need a high current, so I'll use this 6 volt battery as my power source. I know I have a magnetic field because I can pick up screws with my newly created electromagnet. Inductors come in a wide range of shapes and sizes. This is a large high current inductor, about 120 millihenries. The analog parts kit contains two inductors a 1 millihenry inductor and a 1 microhenry inductor. The millihenry inductor is encoded with the numerals 102 on the side and the microhenry inductor has the numerals 1R0. These are both ferrite core inductors. 